Well, Phil Browder, uh, welcome to the show. I just finished your newest book, Freezing Order, um, and I also read your first one, Red Notice, and they're both compelling. They read like thrillers, but of course, this is real life, and we're talking about a true story, an incredibly impactful one at that. Um, I got to ask you at the start here, because when I read the first chapter of Freezing Order, it was unlike anything I've ever read. It immediately hooked me into the story, and I, I imagine this is something that's more commonplace for you, but um, you were in Spain, you were in Madrid, and you found yourself in the back of a police car with very little information being given to you. Can we start there and just kind of walk us through like how that unfolded? Yeah, so um, back in May 2018, I was flying to Madrid. <clears throat> I was invited by the uh, chief anti-corruption prosecutor of Spain, a guy named Jose Grinda, to come in and give him formal testimony um, about uh, Russian money laundering connected to the murder of my lawyer, my Russian lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, that it ended up in Spain. The money was used to purchase luxury real estate. And he asked me to come in and, um, uh, and make a formal testimony to, so he could begin a criminal investigation. So I fly to Madrid. I check into the Grand Hotel in Glez, which is a very nice hotel in old Madrid. Uh, I wake up the next morning. I go to collect my briefcase uh, um, to go to the meeting, to, have, to go down to have breakfast and then go to the meeting with uh, Grinda. And just as I'm opening the door of my hotel room, there's two large uniformed Spanish national police officers um, standing there along with the hotel manager. And the manager who speaks English says to me very politely, uh, Mr. Browder, these men need to see your passport. I hand them my passport. They compare it to some document they have on a clipboard. And they say, you're under arrest. And I say, what for? And the guy with the clipboard says, Interpol, Russia. And at this point, the, um, uh, the manager of the hotel is, um, he, he's, uh, he had upgraded me to the presidential suite of the hotel the night before. And he's worried that his presidential suite is going to be sort of stuck with all my stuff in it for some indeterminate amount of time. And so he begs the police officers to allow me to pack my bags and they agree. And I'm able to go through this maze of, of rooms. And um, when I'm in a far away place, I then uh, try to call my wife. Uh, she's not picking up. I try to call my Spanish lawyer, the guy who set up the meeting with Jose Grinda. Um, he's not answering. And sort of without any other options, I decide that I'm going to tweet out um, what's going on. And so I, I sent out a tweet to, to Twitter saying, urgent, being arrested in Madrid right now on a Russian Interpol warrant. And um, uh, I then press send. I pack my bag very quickly. I go back out to the um, door. Uh, and then the police uh, escort me down to the police car throw me into the back of the police car and off we go. They put the lights on, the sirens, et cetera, and we're sort of going through the streets of old Madrid. And, I, and I'm thinking to myself, well, wait a second, what if these guys aren't even police officers? What if they just got the uniforms and stole a car, tricked the manager of the hotel? What, what if these guys are actually working for the Russians? Um, and I'm gonna be taken off to some airstrip and find myself waking up in a Moscow jail. And so at, at this point, I, and strangely, the guys who arrested me, they, they didn't um, cuff me and they didn't pat me down and they didn't take away my phones. And that was all pretty suspicious. But the fact that I had my phones with me, so I, I had two phones and I took one of the phones out and I, I, I snapped a, a surreptitiously snapped a picture of the back of their heads and all the paraphernalia on the on the dashboard. And um, I tweeted that out. And I said, in the back of the police car on the way to the station, they won't say where they're taking me. And anyone who had doubted that that my first tweet was legitimate, certainly didn't doubt it at this point. And all of a sudden, my phone was on silent, but all of a sudden it started lighting up with news alerts from the Wall Street Journal and Financial Times and New York Times, Browder being arrested in Madrid right now. Um, and all of a sudden, all sorts of calls started coming in that I wasn't answering until I saw the call coming from my lawyer. And I, I really wanted to let him know what was going on. And so 
I kind of dipped down and tried to cuff, put, put my hand over the receiver of the phone and started talking to him. And at this point, the, the police saw what was going on. They pulled over really abruptly and, uh, um, and then got really mad at me and patted me down at this point, took away my phones and pushed me back into the car and off we went again. And then, then we arrived, uh, I was waiting for the police station, but we, then we arrived at some nondescript office building and um, we stop in front of the building. They've ordered me out of the car and I say, what is this? And they say medical exam. <laughs> and uh, I was like, what, a medical exam? Uh, you know, I, I could just, I could picture going into some, some uh, uh, you know, n- office holding, some men holding me down, being injected with something and, and, uh, and off we go. And, and so I refused to go in. I was like ready for a fight. These guys sort of pa- started panicking. One of them started making phone calls. Um, he comes back and says, medical exam, standard protocol. And I say, no medical exam. And he said, yes, medical exam. And I say, I want my lawyer. He said, no lawyer. And so we're sort of standing there for a while and, and nobody is, uh, is, is giving up. And then eventually they relent, push me back into the car. Off we go. And I'm, I don't know what's going on. And eventually we arrive at the police station. And I'm so happy we're arriving at a police station and this is not a kidnapping thing. <laughs> So we go into the police station and, and I'm like, uh, <laughs> they're thinking that they've got Carlos the Jackal, um, you know, uh, everyone was so excited. And, and thankfully, two hours later, the Spanish released me because they got there got so many phone calls from so many journalists and realized what a mess that they had made. Yeah. And as you point out in the book that, you know, Twitter that day really saved your life. Yeah. I mean, everyone complains about Twitter being, you know, this force for evil. But let me tell you that if if I had not tweeted that out. I might have been sent back to Russia by the Spanish, and and it was only because everybody knew my story, knew the fight that I was having with Putin, and knew how illegitimate it was that it put the whole Interpol and Spain and everybody on the back foot, and they realized what a terrible mistake they made. Yeah. I mean, you point out, too, like that Russia was weaponizing Interpol. I I can't imagine this was the first time they tried to do this um, to come after you. Um, What has been done to kind of you know, remedy that so it doesn't happen again? Or is that still a concern that they could weaponize Interpol again? Well, you know, Interpol, so Interpol stands for the International Police Organization, Interpol. The, the, the purpose of Interpol is to catch uh, criminals, fugitives from justice. Um, in my case, Russia has used um, Interpol eight times. They've issued eight Interpol warrants for my arrest <coughs> since um the Magnitsky Act, this piece of legislation I was responsible for, was passed that made Putin so angry. So eight times they've gone gone to Interpol. Now Interpol is supposed to be catching criminals. Um, instead, they're they're working for criminals, going after the guy trying to hold the criminals to account. And so there's something deeply wrong with Interpol if they can't fix this problem, and they haven't fixed this problem. Russia used it eight times, and and. Uh, 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 you know, Interpol, in theory, should throw Russia out of their system if this is what they do, and and certainly after this invasion of Ukraine. But to this day, uh, Russia remains a, a standard, you know, card carrying member of Interpol, where they can post arrest warrants for whomever they want. Um, so the same thing can happen to them. Mm-hmm. You mentioned um, the Magnitsky Act, and we should also talk about Sergei Magnitsky, uh, your friend, your attorney. Um, and let's go back to maybe even more of like the origin stories of your time. You used to be the largest foreign investor in Russia. I know, I, I recall that you took an activist impro- approach to investing. You called out some corruption. At one point, you were kicked out of Russia. Um, they, I think they called you a national security threat. And then ultimately, um, Sergei Magnitsky uncovered this $230 million um, fraud from Russian officials, but I, I would like for you to kind of walk us through um, kind of how we got here. So um, you can hear my accent, it's American. I grew up in Chicago, but I come from an unusual American family. My grandfather was the head of the American Communist Party uh, from 1932 to 1945. He had actually lived in Russia in 19, from 1927 to 32, married my grandmother, my father was born in Russia. So my grandfather comes back to to America, becomes head of the American Communist Party, runs for president twice against Roosevelt in 1936 and 1940, was 
um, put in jail by Roosevelt in 41, pardoned in 42. He was eventually kicked out of the Communist Party in 1945 for being too much of a capitalist. And, and then he was viciously pursued in the McCarthy era for being a communist. So this is my family legacy. Um, I was born in 1964, I'm 58 years old. And when I was going through my teenage rebellion, I was trying to figure out this way of rebelling from my family of communists. And I came up with this perfect strategy, which was to put on a suit and tie and become a capitalist. So I became a capitalist. I went to Stanford Business School. I graduated in 1989, which is the year the Berlin Wall came down. And um, I thought, wow, if my grandfather was the biggest communist in America and the Berlin Wall has just come down, I'm gonna to try to become the biggest capitalist in Eastern Europe. And so I, I uh, finished Stanford Business School. I moved to London and then I moved to Moscow um, in 1996. And I set up an investment fund, it's called the Hermitage Fund. And it grows from zero to becoming the largest investment fund in Russia. And in the process, I discovered that all the companies I was investing in, companies like Gazprom and Sparebank and the National Electricity Company and various other companies were basically being robbed like you can't believe by the people who were managing these companies, the oligarchs and corrupt officials. And so I tried to stop the corruption and stop the stealing. And the way I went about doing that was to research how they went about stealing and then take the research and share it with the Financial Times and the Wall Street Journal and Business Week, et cetera. And from that, um, for, for a period of time, it all worked. But as you can imagine, um, <laughs> exposing high level corruption in Russia doesn't make you too many friends. And as you mentioned, um, I was expelled from the country in 2005. I was declared a threat to national security after they expelled me. Um, and then after that, uh, my offices in Moscow were raided. Uh, the police seized a bunch of documents. And then they used those documents to perpetrate a, a very complex fraud in which they stole um, $230 million of taxes that we paid to the Russian government in the previous year from the Russian government. I had a young lawyer named Sergei Magnitsky investigate. He discovered the $230 million fraud. He testified against the officials involved. And five weeks after he testified against them, the same officials came to his home, arrested him, put him in pretrial detention, where he was then tortured for 358 days until he was murdered by eight riot guards with rubber batons on November 16, 2009, at the age of 37. Yeah. He was a married father this, of two. He, 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 had a, he had a wife and two children and I got the news the next day and it was the most devastating news I could have ever gotten and it's changed my life forever. And I, I made a vow to his, his memory, to his family and to myself that I was not gonna let the people who did this get away with it. And I've put aside everything else I'm, I, I was doing, no more business, and I'm devoting all of my time, all of my resources and all of my energies to going after the people who killed him to make sure they face justice. And for the last 12 and a half years, that's what I've done. And it's culminated in a piece of legislation named after Sergei Magnitsky called the Magnitsky Act. The Magnitsky Act uh, freezes the assets and bans the visas of people who killed Sergei Magnitsky and people who commit other similar human rights abuses. And, um, you know, one of the ways you're able to probably trace some of these folks um, who were behind um, this is probably through the money, that's stolen money. I th that's why you were in Spain. Uh, you mentioned at the top here, investigating some of the luxury real estate. And, and these were, um, you know, government officials, police officers. And in the book you point out, Bill, like some of them were on these police officer salaries. They were very brazen about the money that I guess they had gotten, like driving Porsches and Audis and million dollar, like, Talk to me about tracing the money and talk to us about how just open they were with, I guess, kind of flashing this, you know, Ill the ill-gotten gains um, that they stole. Yeah, so, so this is the thing that's so surprising is that, you, you know, you'd think that the, these guys would would like try to be discreet about it. You know, they, they steal all this money, but it was just the opposite. They, they were they were buying, uh, I mean, and, and I mean, we're, we're not, we're talking like low level cops on $15,000 a year They've got Porsche Cayennes. They're flying uh, all over the world to Paris, to London, to Cuba, to New York. Um, they live in like $2 million condominiums. And 
and, and, and this is just the low level guys and the high level guys were, were like, you know, living even larger. And, and so one of the things that I did as part of this justice campaign was to trace the money. And over a 10 year period, and I, I employed like a full time forensic financial investigator, we found the money. And um, we, we did it together. We, first, we got lucky with some whistleblowers. Then we got we, we started working with law enforcement. Then there were some journalist leaks. And that's what my, my this book, my second book, Refreezing Order is all about is, is how we got all this information, how we followed the money. And once we get the, once we figured out where the money was, we would then take that information and file a com criminal complaint with a law enforcement agency of the country where the money showed up. And so some of the money actually went to New York. So like uh, high end condos in in Manhattan, and um, and we took that to the Department of Justice, and the Department of Justice then opened a criminal investigation, and all of a sudden, you know, the Russians were in a U.S. court trying to justify where they got this money from. Yeah, um, how do you like, walk, can, I don't know how much you can share, but how does one even begin to follow the money? Like, what are kind of the steps that? Are, are taken. I, I, in the book, you mention um, like a 1782 subpoena. I had never heard of this, but can you kind of, you know, take folks inside um, that journey? Yeah. Well, so I should point out that I, I knew nothing about money laundering investigations either before I had this murder to deal with. And um, of course, I became very highly motivated to figure out how to trace the money. And, and it's not like there, it's not like it's just sitting there to be ready to be traced. You have to be you kind of have to get lucky. And um, <clears throat> our first bit of luck um, was that in Russia itself, <clears throat> there's no such thing as data protection. And so if, um, if somebody, um, I mean, so I, basically, if I wanted to, um, I could buy a database and find out what your salary is, I could find out how much money you have in your bank accounts, I could find out um, uh, your medical records, I could, everything in Russia is for sale. And so, um, uh, to a certain extent, once we started looking at this stuff, like we, that's where we found out about all these cops and their million or $2 million condos and all that kind of stuff was because there's all this information that's readily available. Um, and so we, we were able to start the, the search by in Russia, basically buying these databases for nothing. I mean, it costs like five or 10 bucks or 50 bucks max to buy these databases and we could trace some of the money that way. Um, but the trouble is that that after a certain point, we couldn't trace the money. And, the, and this is where New York comes into it. And, and um, I didn't know about this, and, and I, uh, but I, I hired a, a lawyer named John Moscow, who is a former prosecutor, New York prosecutor, who told me about a really interesting thing, which is that all dollar payments, even from one Russian bank to another or a Russian bank to a Moldovan bank or whatever, all those payments for a split second have to go through what that what's called a US clearing bank. So they can't pay each other directly, they've got to pay each other via New York. And so that money that record um, uh, is in New York of where that transfer went. And what I learned was that you could do something it was called a, um, a 1782 subpoena, which meant you could go to the court in New York, and ask the court to subpoena JP Morgan or Citibank or whoever the money, the money center bank is, that did the clearing and they would hand it over to you. And so we, we did a, a subpoena that was organized by this guy, John Moscow. And um, we found out where all the next set of a layer of transfers went. Um, and then we eventually found the money. And what, what was most interesting is that we found the money, the Department of Justice then seized about $20 million worth of properties in Manhattan, like super luxury apartments and in just beautiful buildings. They seize these um, uh, apartments, or I should say they freeze them, and then they file something called a federal forfeiture order, which means that they want to then seize the, 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 the money, take it away. And um, once they filed that motion, <laughs> um, I, I kinda, it, it kind of seemed to me to be like, um, for the Russians, a lost cause that they would walk away from the whole thing and just let their property get seized. But no, not, not at all. They, they decided to fight. And what, who do they hire um, to help them fight was none other than John Moscow, yeah. the same lawyer who I had hired to help me track down the money. Yeah, we'll now, come, yeah. I was like, we'll come back to, uh, you know, John Moscow, someone uh, you called out as one of the Western enablers. I think that was one of the things that was so striking in the book is just how many um, Westerners were enabling this. 
Well, yeah, so, so this is what's so weird. So, so this guy, John Moscow, um, was, uh, you know, he, he was my lawyer and he then switched sides. So it's one thing to work for the Russians, but it's another thing to switch sides to go and work for the Russians. So he switches sides. And one of the things he warned me about when he first started working for me was how dangerous the Russians were. And then the first thing he does after switching sides is he then organizes a subpoena and demands all sorts of information from me, including like my personal security arrangements and like my, all my travel records, where I went, who I went, wh where I went, all sorts of other like really personal stuff that could be used <laughs> um, by a government that wants to kill me. Yeah. So basically he's subpoenaing all this information that, that, that the Russian government could use to try to kill me. And so it's, I mean, it's, and so he's just one of the Western enablers. There was another one, a guy named Glenn Simpson. He was a former Wall Street Journal reporter. He worked, uh, he had a firm called Fusion GPS. You, you may have heard that name because he was the one who prepared the Trump dossier. Um, at the same time as he was preparing the Trump dossier, he was paid by the Russians um, to try to destroy the Magnitsky Act and to try to go after me and to try to find me in all these different places and, and, uh, surveil me and so on and so forth. Um, you had you had a U.S. congressman named Dana Rohrbacher. He was a Repu Republican from Orange County, who was trying to uh, work for the Russians to to uh, repeal the Magnitsky Act or take Sergei Magnitsky's name off of the Magnitsky Act. Um, I mean, there, there, there's just a whole bunch of these people that showed up one one place or another to uh, to do this Russian enabling. Yeah. And then on the other side of things, um, the folks who were whistleblowers or folks who helped advocate for the Magnitsky Act in the book, I mean, you, you highlight folks who um, were murdered, who were, were poisoned in the book, and you're just mentioning, you know, um, your own personal safety. Um, can you shed a bit more light on just how dangerous the situation is? You know, what is kind of your, I don't know how much you can share, but I'd imagine the way you live your life, your routines. I know you kind of um, shared some things in the book about, you know, not going to some of the fashionable bars or not eating at the same places. I think at one point you had your calendar was um, completely hard. It wasn't like a digital footprint, if you will. Take us through like what 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 life is like for you. Well, first of all, these guys are after me and they want to kill me. Um, Dmitry Medvedev, who is who was at once once during Putin's reign president very briefly and prime minister as well he was he was asked in davos by uh, uh a journalist in a in a closed door meeting about the death of sergey magnitsky and he said it's too bad that sergey magnitsky is dead and bill browder is still alive and running around uh the general prosecutor of russia who's the equivalent of the u.s attorney general publicly announced at a press conference bill browder shouldn't sleep peacefully at night and then putin at the uh, helsinki summit uh, uh, with Trump, asked Trump to hand me over. And, and this is just like, you know, some, just some, some, just one, some of many details of things of death threats, of kidnapping threats. Uh, they've issued, as I mentioned, they've issued eight arrest, Interpol arrest warrants. They've tried to have me extradited. Um, they've followed me around, surveilled me. Um, they've uh, sued me in all sorts of different courts on all sorts of different spurious grounds. They've sentenced me to 18 years in prison in Russia in absentia. I mean, there's they made movies about me. There's like a whole, whole sort of operation to try to ruin me. And um, uh, yeah, of course, I mean, I've got to, I've got to live my life in a very different way than most people because um, it's I'm constantly on defense. Even when I'm on offense, I'm on defense there. And, and they have a lot of resources at their disposal in which they could, you know, cause me harm. And so there is this famous expression, um, uh, I've got to be lucky every day. Um, they only have to be lucky once. And so it, it's, um, it's, it's not an easy life, but um, so far I've succeeded in surviving, which is a major accomplishment in my, in my mind. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how much you can share, but I mean, could you like explain some of the things that you do? I mean, I don't, I don't want you to give away anything that you know, could jeopardize you, but just to give folks just a, a, a taste of what, what, you, what you deal with. Well, I, I absolutely don't want to give any give away any of my protocols because then then they'll just uh, you know it's it may be amusing for for your listeners yeah. and, and so on, but it's it's um, be less amusing for for me and my family if they if they uh, you know were able to take advantage of 
of the things we do. But but you know, suffice to say that that um, you know I, I I have a highly um, organized way of of um, uh, trying to avoid assassination, and uh, and it's not the obvious things. I mean, I'll tell you that that. The, the idea that you can employ a bunch of big guys to surround you and that's going to save your life is is a complete fiction. Um, the the, um, the the bodyguard industry working for me one one week um, will gladly work for the my enemies just like John Moscow did the next week for twice the money. And so best not to have anyone know your details. So it's more about information about what your enemies know and about what your enemies can predict that ends up determining uh, how to avoid you know, yeah. death by assassination. Of course. Um, there's an example you shared in the book. Um, you were in Monaco, but you didn't stay in Monaco because um, you stayed in France just for your own um, safety. And uh, there was a woman who approached you at the, in the line of the buffet and then was sending you some emails. And it was kind of like, again, it was just like, you're reading it and it, it reads like something out of a thriller, but this is real life. And like how even that was scary, just knowing your location. And then later at this event, and I'll have you reshare it, there were literally organized crime members, like convicted mobsters, Dmitry Kluyev um, was there, um, I guess, advocating against the Magnitsky Act. You have a lot of these folks, they'll go to these events to, you know, uh, advocate against what you've been, the work you've been doing on, on the world stage. But can you kind of share with the folks um, the Monaco experience? Yeah. So in, um, I think this is 2011, I was... Um, <clears throat> I was invited to something called the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly. So OSCE is the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which most probably 99% of the people listening to this will never have heard of, which is a basically a, it's a it's a, a collection of members of parliament from many, many countries around the around Europe and around the world, the United States, Canada, Europe, even Russia belong to it. And um, it's supposed to be an organization bring, bringing together parliamentarians to um, discuss human rights and, and um, peace and, and all this kind of stuff. And, and this was a great opportunity for me in this, this, um, this big meeting they were having in Monaco. It was in the summer of 2011, where I could show up and they were gonna discuss putting, to, putting together a recommendation or resolution for all countries to adopt a Magnitsky Act, which is the legislation which I've spent my life working on since Sergei Magnitsky was killed. And so I was invited to this OSCE Parliamentary Assembly and, and we had a movie that we showed at this meeting, which was a movie about a, 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 this guy named Dmitry Kluyev. Dmitry Kluyev was a Russian gangster who was head of the Kluyev Organized Crime Group. And it was the Kluyev Organized Crime Group that organized the $230 million theft that um, Sergei Magnitsky discovered and was killed over. And so I made this little movie, it was like a 15 minute movie and I was gonna show this movie and I showed it. Um, it was really a good little movie. And in fact, if you, if you have anyone listening who wants to see it, it's on, it, you, you, you can just go into my, uh, we have a website called Russian Untouchables. And this was the fourth video on that website. It's on YouTube. Um, it's a great movie and um, and I showed it to um, about 100 members of parliament or 100 people, I mean, I think 50 members of parliament and 50 staff members at this at this um, political gathering. And uh, they were all very interested and it helped support the um, my argument to, to do a Magnitsky Act. And then um, at the end of the movie, I was invited by a, 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 one of the parliamentarians to come to a, um, a drinks and, and dinner reception, which was taking place at a hotel called Le Meridien, which was right on the water on the on the beautiful you know Côte d'Azur so I agree and I have a colleague with me and so we go down there and and uh, it's the strangest situation there's just like Russian people everywhere Russian speaking everywhere and uh, uh, anyways we uh, I, I wasn't even too sure I wanted to be there but my colleague said you know we came here for their mission let's just carry on and so on anyway so I'm, I'm standing in line at the buffet and the the government of Monaco which is this very wealthy, is a wealthy, very wealthy little country has has almost no people and just all rich people. Anyways, they put on this unbelievable spread. So I'm standing there in line, uh, very hungry because I hadn't had lunch. Standing there in line, and and I feel something bumping into my back, and and so I kind of move forward in this buffet line, and and I feel this bumping in again, and 
And I kind of turn around and there's this um, very beautiful six foot tall, blonde um, Russian model standing behind me. And she starts a conversation and, and, uh, and she says, um, uh, what are you here for? And I say, I'm here for the um, OSC Parliamentary Assembly. And, uh, and I say, what are you here for? And she says, uh, well, I'm in fashion, but I think politics is so interesting. And I said, okay. <laughs> And I, I, I didn't really want to be associating with any Russians because I've just been like, you know, um, <laughs> talking about how Russian government and organized crime is, about, is the same exact thing. And so I, um, I get my dinner and, and um, get my plate and, and um, uh, I'm, I go and, and eat my food. And, and, uh, and as I'm eating my food, I, um, I'm approached by some of the people who are at the, um, uh, at the movie before and they start talking to me and, and, uh, uh, and then this woman, uh, the same woman who was in back of me in line, sort of sta is, is sort of standing there in this group, and and we're talking, and we finish the conversation, and and they ask me for my business card, the politicians, and so I start handing my business card to each each of the people, and and there's this woman, and uh, and uh, I hand her my card, it's kind of awkward not to, and and uh, anyway, so I finish my meal, I I leave the hotel, and and I should point out that I'm I'm not staying in Monaco, I'm not, I'm staying in a hotel. Monaco is a tiny little country and, I, and like 10 minutes away, you can be in France and and the um, uh, prince of Monaco, Prince Albert is like a good friend of Putin's. And so it's actually a very dangerous place for anyone who's an enemy of Putin to stay because he cooperates with Putin going after uh, Putin's enemies. And so anyway, so I'm staying in France. I get to my little room in France. Um, I'm checking emails and then this um, email pops into my box from this uh, Svetlana Melnikova from, and she says, you know, dear Mr. William, um, she, uh, I, I thought we had such a great connection. Would you like to meet for a drink? And I'm thinking great connection. We, we, we've, we've like, you know, spoken for all of like, uh, you know, 30 seconds in, in line. Um, and so I just kind of ignore it. I think this is like really, it's pretty, pretty um, ridiculous. And, um, and then like about, 45 minutes later, another email comes in and says, uh, dear, uh, dear Mr. William, um, uh, I can't stop thinking about you. Will you meet me for a drink? And, and I'm just laughing to myself. You know, I'm, I'm a five foot nine middle aged, bald businessman, you know, uh, like, six foot. Could they blonde, be any more obvious? <laughs> Six like foot blonde Russian models who I've spoken for 30 seconds, you know, don't, don't throw themselves at me. I mean, this was a honey trap if there ever was one. And, and I mean, it, it was pretty clumsy, but, but it was also scary because, um, not because of her, but because if, if the Russians knew I was there and they were, you know, like organizing a honey trap, what else were they going to be doing? And, and then we discovered the next day what else they were going to be doing. So I hightailed it out of there. I didn't want to stay in Monaco if the Russians knew I was there. Um, but it turned out that that um, Dmitry Kluyev, the guy we made the movie about, a convicted criminal, the head of the Kluyev, Kluyev organized crime group, showed up at the invitation of the Russian government to meet with the head of the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly um, to try to talk him out of having this resolution about the Magnitsky Act. And um, thankfully, I, I had a bunch of allies there, and they actually then they, they they took a little video of Dmitry Kluyev there. And we made that public, and the whole thing actually ended up backfiring on the Russians, and and the and the resolution passed with uh, you know passed through sailed through with only the Russians and the Kazakhstanis voting against it. But it really goes to show how much um, you know the, the how organized the Russians were, <laughs> even if it was clumsy organization and and sort of ridiculous organization that they were ready to like do anything to try to stop me. Yeah, it's, like as you point out, it kind of shows you just how far they are willing to go. And, um, you know, one of the things we should bring up, because I didn't know this, but um, when the Magnitsky Act first passed, uh, Vladimir Putin immediately retaliated by banning the adoption of Russian orphans by American families. And you go into detail about that and why why that was so Severe, and I, I didn't realize that the two were linked, but it's a really important um, association to bring up. Walk to, walk the folks through, like why, why? Explain how cruel that that move really was, and it shows how much they hate the Magnitsky Act. So the Magnitsky Act was passed on December fourteenth, two thousand twelve, and it, it went right to the heart of the Putin regime. The Putin regime steals money, and then keeps their money offshore. And the idea that that that, could, that money could be frozen really upset them. 
And so what does Putin do in retaliation? Um, like literally the next week, and in a very explicit way, he then banned the adoption of Russian orphans by American families. And of course, that sounds bad on the surface, but it's actually 100 times worse than you could ever imagine. The orphans that were um, uh, being put up for adoption were the sick ones. They didn't, the, the healthy orphans didn't get adopted by the West. They, they, they were adopted in Russia. They, they gave the sick ones to the Americans, the, the children with um, HIV that they inherited from their mother or Down syndrome or spina bifida or fetal alcohol syndrome, all sorts of ugly ailments. Um, many of which many of these ailments could be dealt with, but not good ones. And the Americans would come year after year in the thousands and adopt these babies and take them back to America and nurse them to health where they would live, um, you know, productive and healthy lives. If those if those uh, orphans were not allowed to be adopted, as Putin uh, created the situation, uh, the Russian orphanages didn't have the resources to treat them. And so a lot of these babies would die. And so Putin was basically killing his own babies to make a point about um, the Magnitsky Act. And I mean, if there's if there was one thing that's ever happened in this whole story that truly gets to the heart of Putin's evil, I think it's that. It just shows what a terrible human being he is, that he's ready to kill children for his own corruption. So I, I would, it seems to me that the the 230 million that was exposed, it was the largest tax fraud. It led to ultimately um, the creation of the Magnitsky Act. It seems like there's so much more to this. Like it's the tip of the iceberg. And I think you're 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 alluding to it there. Like it shows like the cruelness, the the grasp for power. Like, what do you think it is that's going on there? Um, from well, uh, I mean, ba basically. What, what the, the, you know, people, people can't really imagine anyone not being like them. And so we think, you know, we look at Russian government officials, we say they're government officials, and, you know, they're trying to do their, you know, serve their country. Nobody goes into the government in Russia to serve their country from the policeman traffic, lowest traffic policeman right up to the president. Everybody goes to public into into quote public service or government service to steal money. And um, what we discovered from this story is that um, you know everything about Vladimir Putin? So he, he, here he is. Um, we have a guy, Sergei Magnitsky, a, a patriot of Russia, who discovers the theft of two hundred thirty million dollars of his country's money, not my money, his country's money, from his country, and and instead of being patted on the back and thanked for his service, he's murdered, and then the president gets involved in the cover up of his murder, and. It exonerates the people who stole the money. And that tells you everything about Vladimir Putin. And of course, kills his own orphans in the process and kills anyone else who stands in the way. And, and the, one of the reasons they hate the Magnitsky Act so much and why they've spent so much time on me and with lawyers and death threats and extradition and red notices and all this kind of stuff is because this story proves that Putin is just a crook. Not nothing more. Not not a, in any way a statesman, not a patriot, not a nationalist, but a crook. And if this were to be widely known inside Russia, he he, he would they wouldn't allow it to happen. They would not allow it to happen. And so this story kind of bears, you know, bears it all about uh, Vladimir Putin. And, and I should say one other thing, a really important thing, which is that this it turns out from our own research that the Magnitsky case was one of a thousand similar cases. And so the amount of money stolen by Putin and the people around him was not 230 million. It was 230 billion. And that number is quantifiable and provable. We even found it going through a Danish bank called Dansky Bank. Um, and there's a huge scandal there. And so this is this is why and, 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 and it, why is Putin at war right now in Ukraine? He's at war because he needs a huge distraction because why would people put up with this type of stuff? Yeah, and after a while, they get tired of this type of stuff, of all this money going for yachts and villas and planes instead of hospitals and schools and filling the potholes in the road. And so he started this war as a major war of distraction. Let's explore that further, um, a major war of distraction, like understanding his motivations. Like, I I'd like to hear a bit more on that. Well, it's so... 
he's sitting there 22 years and 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 let me just give get get the numbers right out there so we were able to prove 232 billion dollars was stolen from the russian government and the russian state over a 22 uh, over a 20 year period um going through dansky bank and we have all the numbers to prove it i would i would estimate that if we had the numbers from Raiffeisen Bank in Vienna and Deutsche Bank and various other banks, the numbers would be closer to a trillion dollars of money that was stolen from the Russian people by this thousand person clique of, of people around Putin, uh, you know, headed by Putin and around Putin. And so a thousand billion dollars. And, and so it's just an, an unbelievable amount of money. And, and, you know, you can't do that forever in a country where people vote every once in a while, even if it's not a real democracy, people, you know, get tired of it. And, and we've seen this happen before, like in Tunisia, some fruit seller set himself on fire. And all of a sudden that was the Arab Spring and, and the government of Tunisia fell and then the government of Egypt and so on and so forth. Uh, in Kazakhstan, something that most people probably didn't pay attention to, they had a dictator even who'd been in longer in place than Putin, stolen even more money per capita. His name was Nur Sultan Nazarbayev. And they raised the price of gas in January of this year, and the whole place blew up. And he ended up losing, and, and uh, he, you know, losing all of his power, and everyone around him losing their power, and their money is now being hoovered up by the by the new group. And so Putin is watching this, and and he understands that at any point something can happen, and and it's a very brittle situation. It's very even more brittle after COVID. And so he's not a guy who's just going to wait for it to happen. He he needs to change the narrative. And what does a dictator do when they're scared that they're going to lose power? It's like Dictator 101, out of, straight out of the dictator's playbook. You start a war. You get everyone to rally around the flag. You get everyone to hate a foreign enemy. You don't those people. Those you don't want them to hate you. You want them to hate the Ukrainians. And and he's successfully done that. His approval ratings have gone through the roof. Everyone is is frothing at the mouth, angry at Ukrainians who have done nothing to the Russians. And why did he do this? He did it because of this money. What do you think is like the end game? Like how do you think this plays out? Like how how are you thinking about it? Well, everyone wants to know what is the end game, and the answer is, this is the end game. The end game is to be at war. He doesn't want to be at peace. So when you hear like these very learned um, Russia experts or Sovietologists or political scientists talking about NATO enlargement or the grand Russian empire with Putin wants and reading his speeches and trying to decipher every word in his speech, they've completely got it wrong. Um, it's not like we can give him like a piece of Ukraine and like have, and then he'll say, okay, thank you very much. I'm done. He needs to be at war. He needs to be at war so that the Russian people rally around him. And for what it's worth, even with all these sanctions, which I, I very much strongly support, but even with all these sanctions, because we're not sanctioning oil and gas, he's making more money than he's ever made before. It's unbelievable how, how, how much money is flowing into him. And so He's loving this right now and he's going to carry on and he doesn't care for a single second about all these young men who are being chopped up as cannon fodder in the Russian army. He could care less about these people. So he's making and, more uh, money than he ever has before right now. Yeah, the, the price of oil is higher than yeah. it's ever been and and it's just flowing to him like like never before. And so yes, some of his money is frozen, but whatever is frozen is quickly being replaced by all this new money that's coming in from Germany and Italy and so on for the purchase of natural gas and oil. Yeah. And yeah. and the Chinese are just in the FT today there's a big article about how uh Xi Jinping is talking about doing more business with Russia than ever before and so on and so forth. And so you know, Putin is he's this is this is the, the end game. Yeah. And so anyone who thinks that there's going to be some kind of peace treaty and it's all going to be it's all going to sort of calm down. I, I the only way that's going to happen. Uh, well, it's two things. One is if the Ukrainians um, destroy the Russian military and drive them out of uh, Ukraine, which I think is a low probability event. Or if Putin needs to like a pause to rearm and get everything back to organized, um, he might do some kind of tactical uh, peace treaty, but he he likes being at war. And and for what it's worth, if he's if he doesn't, if we don't stop him or the Ukrainians don't stop him in Ukraine, then he's going to be at a border, a NATO border, um, next. You know, Estonia or Lithuania or Poland. And then and then and then he's going to be um, pointing his guns at Estonia and pointing a nuclear weapon at Washington and one at Berlin and one at London. And he's going to say to us, "Are you ready to go to nuclear war with me?" And lose, possibly lose 20 million people 
um, over the fate of a country that that 99% of Americans couldn't locate on a map. And he's hoping we're going to say, actually, no. And then all of a sudden, NATO falls apart. And he has, a, you know, free reign to do whatever he wants. That's his fantasy. Yeah. And so we have to do everything to stop him from from that. Because, you know, we don't want to end up in a World War Two type of situation, which is what, you know, if all of a sudden he's got all these con- new countries, because we were didn't want to defend them, because we're all, you know, not doing Article Five of NATO, that that's not a good scenario. And we have to stop him every way we can. And the best way to do that is to, is to support the Ukrainians, however, they need the support. Yeah. And, you know, you've been warning about Vladimir Putin for over a decade at this point, And you just mentioned, you know, some of the things we need to do, um, support the Ukrainians. What what else can be done um, to step up here? Well, so if the oil price wasn't so high, um, uh, Putin wouldn't be so doing so well. And the Saudis, Saudi Arabia only exists because we protect them. We provide them with a military um, uh, blanket, basically. If we didn't, they wouldn't exist. And the deal has always been in history that they provide stable oil prices in exchange for for the you know right to exist. And I don't know why we're not just leaning on them like they've never been lent on before to pump an extra three million barrels a day out and, and lower the oil price by thirty five percent. I don't know why we, we don't have a policy of just you know let's just get every oil well that's um, uh, you know, fracking oil well you know pipelines everything let's just get uh everything going in 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 the u.s and and get the canadians going and let, let, let's get some some oil pumped so that we're producing more oil and let's do everything we can um to replace uh wh- wh- wherever we can so to replace the consumption of oil with uh, alternative energy so that we have uh so that the demand for oil goes down so the supply goes up the demand goes down and the oil price crashes that would be the thing that puts putin out of business and you know, in a, in a heartbeat, if the oil price were to go down to $25 a barrel, he wouldn't be smiling so much anymore. How, um, how realistic do you think that is? Well, um, Biden is supposed to be traveling to Saudi Arabia imminently. And so let's see what happens there. But, um, I'm afraid he's too nice. He should be, you know, he, he should let these guys know in no uncertain terms that their existence depends on us. And right now we need him, we need them to pump a lot more oil, uh, like right now. What, are, what do you think are some of the other consequences of, you know, Russia's invasion of Ukraine? You're mentioning um, some earlier, but just like the far reaching consequences, just maybe globally, what are some of the impacts that you're worried about? Well, so, if, for example, the, the Russians, Ukraine and Russia together export 40 percent of all the wheat that's consumed in the world. Um, that wheat has been blocked by the Russian military and the Russian Navy in the Black Sea as a result of that blockade. There is going to be a starvation crisis in Africa, Asia, and Latin America um, that's going to be unprecedented in the history of the world. Many more multiples of people will die from that than bombs in Ukraine. This is Putin's direct responsibility. And again, something can be done about that. We could set up a military convoy in the water to allow the wheat, the, the boats with the wheat to leave. And, and we should uh, say to the Russians, if you fire on any of these boats, we'll fire on you. Um, and so we don't end up with this high food price and starvation crisis and refugee crisis, which will come as a result of that. All of a sudden, you know, tens of millions of refugees will be flowing north. And what will happen from all this high oil price, high wheat price and refugee crisis will be a change of our governments. They will have populists popping up all over the place. And, and, uh, and this is what Putin's banking on. He's waiting, waiting for all this stuff to lead to change in governments and change in policy towards Ukraine and you know, a, a weakening of the sanctions and, and a weakening of resolve to help Ukraine. That's what he, he, he can't win militarily. And so he's going to create this, this political crisis for us in the West. And he's very good at it. Yeah, it's a really, um, you know, sobering uh, picture. We only have a few more minutes. And I, I just want to ask you a couple of follow-ons um, to the Magnitsky Act, um, you know, where it is, where it stands today, um, maybe even some of the more recent developments, um, you know, some of the the work you're doing, you know, calling out these human rights abusers. Um, are you all seeing more people be called out and sanctioned by it? Um, and where are you seeing those sanctions take place? So um, uh, the Magnitsky Act now exists, not just in the United States, but in the UK and Canada, in Australia, in the 27 countries in the European Union, in Norway, in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. 
I'm, I'm testifying in front of the Irish Parliament next week um, for an Irish Magnitsky Act. I'm going to, um, at the end of next week, I'm going to Prague. Um, uh, the Czech government has agreed on a Czech Magnitsky Act. And so I'm hoping that um, the Magnitsky Act becomes this tool to go after bad guys, not just Russian bad guys, but like the Chinese ones who have set up the concentration camps for the Uyghur people and, and the Iranians who are busy taking hostages and, and a bunch of other bad uh, actors all over the world. Um, and so I'm hoping that, so we have at the moment 34 Magnitsky Acts. I'm hoping that, that you know, maybe we get up to 50. Um, and, and then every country that has it starts using it really aggressively against these bad actors. And um, uh, if that were to happen, and it's starting to happen, I mean, the U.S. has sanctioned more than 500 individuals and entities in a lot of different countries. And, and it's very gratifying and it's most gratifying to watch how everyone starts squirming in these countries when it happens. They all panic and and you know get all upset and everybody around them wonders that they're next and and it really ch just changes the whole uh sort of equation the 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 balance of power has changed from dictator um to victim and and uh, uh it's really a very um, unbelievable and powerful tool and and uh yeah, it's very much what i'm spending my time on right now mm -hmm. and you know i mentioned um you're the best-selling author of two books we have red notice now freezing order, and you really shed light on these things. You tell some of the stories, the untold stories of folks who are, you know, victims of uh, Vladimir Putin. And in this book in particular, I think what stood out is you called out the folks who are the Western enablers, whether it was like the bank, um, the lawyers, the former Wall Street Journal reporters turned spin doctors, um, a congressman, a former congressman, if you will. Um, what have you heard from the folks uh, that were called out? Have they, have they, responded or they ever said anything and I, I think it's a powerful tool too that that you've um used here to really shed light on this so I'd love to kind of hear your but thoughts I mean, there. I, I, I mean I probably could have written t a book 10 times longer if I included all these um bad guys these western bad guys these enablers um I was only able to to include a few um but they're all now I mean you know as a as a as a group not just because of my book but because of what's happening in Russia they're all like hiding under their tables pretending they never did any of this stuff because it's so obviously wrong to be supporting the Putin regime and um uh I'm hoping that that uh, there will be legislation in different countries that uh, makes life more difficult so for example in America they have something called the Foreign Agent Registration Act FARA which is supposed to um, require um, Americans working on behalf of foreign governments to publicly register and state that they are so that when they're lobbying on Capitol Hill, everyone understands they're lobbying on behalf of a dictator. They're not just there, you know, sort of in, in, because they're, they're Americans interested in a certain policy. Um, it's That's a great piece of legislation. It's hardly ever enforced. And we saw it being violated all over the place in the Magnitsky case and many other cases that needs to be enforced. Um, uh, in, in where I live in the UK, they don't have a, a FARA. They're just talking about putting it in place now. Same thing in the EU. Um, I think that there should be um, like really strong penalties against uh, lawyers who um, sue journalists to try to shut them up when they're just trying to report the, uh, the facts. And th that's called SLAP, a strategic lawsuit against public participation. They need to put SLAP legislation in, in all these countries. And I'm working with various lawmakers to do that. Um, and, and then there should be um, just all sorts of other police investigations into money laundering, which doesn't happen because, you know, you had literally a trillion dollars of money stolen out of, out of Russia. And I don't think that, that even like 500 million of that has been prosecuted. And so that tells you that there's a real problem with our law enforcement systems. Yeah. You know, Sergei Magnitsky was a brave man and he stood up for what was right until the very end. And, I have to say, you have a lot of courage as well and bravery. Where does where does that come from? Well, my my, I don't know if I have a lot of courage or bravery. I've got a, a, like an absolute feeling of indignation and heartbreak. Sergei Magnitsky was killed um, because of me, and and uh, you know, if I if I'm not doing something every day to sort of avenge his killers, to make his his sacrifice meaningful, and to try to create some balance and justice then I, I, I feel like uh, poison is pumping through my veins. And so I'm motivated by injustice in, in a very powerful way. Well, Bill Browder, you're one of the most effective human rights activists 
of our time. And I encourage folks to pick up your new book, Freezing Order, A True Story of Money Laundering, Murder, and Surviving Vladimir Putin's Wrath. And if they haven't done so already, also pick up uh, Red Red Notice. They're both uh, must-reads. I thank you again, Bill Browder, for your time today. Thank you.